Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. We're going to do some practicals. You ready? All right. Acts of the Apostles and chapter 3. Believers' Convention is one of those meetings that does not have a subject. Just Acts 3. So, <laughs> I know I've been using that theme to teach at this convention for 24 years. We began this meeting as Rivers of Joy. Uh, times of refreshing, 1995, and just the same text. Just go over it and go over it and go over it. At some time, the point, the text will say, check the next verse. What, uh, what about this one? So we're there. Are you there? Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of, of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, I told you earlier that verse 19b to 21 Ought to be like a sub paragraph because it summarizes what you can call the message of the Old Testament prophets. This is what they spoke about. In other words, when, when Jesus met the, or when he was with the 12 and maybe the 70 together, I'm 20, 120, in Luke's Gospel 24, and Luke tells us in 25 that he said to them, uh, particularly the first two, Cleopas and the unnamed uh, brother with him or person with him, said, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Uh, notice the word, enter into his glory. That word, to enter into his glory, uh, is a word used for something that had never happened before. Now, we have the idea that Jesus, without the idea, pardon me, that Jesus sat down in one seat, then he left. He came to the earth to show the way. When he was done with the way, he went back to sit again. You know? <laughs> no. Whatever happened to Jesus in the resurrection happened for the first time. That's why he said, enter into his glory, a secomai doxa. That is, this hasn't happened before. Whatever happened in the resurrection of Jesus hadn't happened before. And this gives you something to think about. What was so unique about the resurrection of Jesus wasn't the fact that he used to be dead, he's no longer dead. There were other people who were raised from the dead, whether it's in the Old Testament or the four Gospels. We had people who were dead and came back to life. We had Jairus' daughter, we had Lazarus, and uh, many other people. The who were dead and raised from the dead. But what then was unique? Jesus entered into his glory. What is that glory? The glory is eternal life in man forever. That is what was and is unique about his resurrection. And so when he says he entered into his glory in Luke's Gospel 24 and then 25 to 26 and 27 now says he, then in 27 and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus' explanation of the book of Genesis through to Exodus, then Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, through to Joshua, Judges, and all that, was about himself. There was nothing Jesus taught called there to be a Daniel. The most of our time, the Joshua generation, that's confusion. We are the Gideon generation. No, you are confused. All the prophets of the Old Testament, all the servants of the Old Testament pointed to Christ. In fact, they deliberately, I've taught you, taught you this over and over again, they deliberately showed their weaknesses to point to Christ. Imagine, Moses is the one who wrote the account of his own weaknesses, his own anger, his own indiscretions. Why were they doing that? They were doing that to give glory to Jesus. So, writing their imperfections was deliberate. They didn't hide it. It was to point to Jesus Christ. 
So we don't go into the Old Testament to become Daniel or become David or become Moses. No. We look at how they pointed to Jesus. And so Acts 3, 19, the B part through to 22, like I said earlier, will be a subparagraph. This is what the prophets were saying. This is what they were saying. A restitution of all things through the resurrection, we will be refreshed. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus is towards man. The resurrection power is towards us. What happened to Jesus becomes the experience of the man that is born again now. How is it so? Because Jesus is the one who tabernacles and begins to live in the man. This is what is in the resurrection. So he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, much later when he met a larger audience, and then he told them to touch him, a spirit has no flesh and bone as you see me have, then he took the honeycomb and all of that. In 44, Luke's gospel, he says, These are the words which I said to you while I was yet with you. Now, I need you to pay attention here. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, notice something he just said. These are the words which I said to you while I was yet with you. All things must be fulfilled. Why is he saying that? That means many things that Jesus referred to or said in the four Gospels were promises or call it prophecies. They were things that will be fulfilled. Now they're fulfilled definitely, but should be fulfilled. For example, <clears throat> in Luke's Gospel 4.18, he goes into the temple and then he, he finds the place where it was written precisely Isaiah 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, when he says to preach the gospel to the poor, it doesn't mean he will go to the slums and give them indomie noodles. No. To preach the gospel to the poor, the last statement there says, declare the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, the year of being welcome, the year of favor, the year where debts are paid, the year where People's sins are forgiven. So whoever he called the poor are the ones that will be recipients of the acceptable year of the Lord. So he describes who the poor are. He said the poor are brokenhearted. He said the poor are blind, spiritually speaking. He says the poor are captives. So Luke 4, 18 became fulfilled when Jesus rose from the dead. Because the condition of being brokenhearted or being blind in Luke 4, 18, or the condition of being a captive was the state of, a heart, of the heart. It wasn't referring to his physical miracles, even though his physical miracles pointed out there, but what he was referring to was what he would do in redemption. He will recover sight. He will preach deliverance to the captives. He will set at liberty them that are bruised. This didn't happen in the four Gospels. This happened when he rose from the dead. That has to be very clear. So the signs of that were the healing and physical miracles that he did. They pointed to this, the gospel to the poor. Everyone without the spirit of God and the life of God is poor. Jesus is the one that makes us rich by the generosity, the grace of God in his resurrection. Never read the Bible with the lenses of your own understanding. The first thing when you study the Bible is have its own understanding. You mustn't read the Bible with your mindset. He said today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Which means 
that Jesus in the four gospels functioned like a prophet. He's prophesying. He's talking about what had not happened. Our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, it happened in his resurrection. Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, you have eternal life, it happened in the resurrection. John 4, 10, if you knew the gift of God and he that asked of you, you will have asked of him, he will have given you living water. If you drink of this water, verse 13, you will thirst again, but he that drinks of the water that gives himself, have in himself, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. All these things were prophecies. They all happened in his resurrection. The Feast of Tabernacles, John 7. Jesus stood out, John 7, 36 and 37, and cried out, He that is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. For as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John says, this spake he of the Spirit, with those that believe on him shall receive. But the Holy Ghost was not yet, because Jesus was not glorified yet. Now John added that with understanding. Because they must have wondered, what's he talking about? He is prophesying. Just like the prophets of the Old Testament, they would use present tense terms of things that God promised to do. Jesus did the same. When Isaiah said himself, boy, infirmities, that didn't happen until hundreds of years after. But he used a present tense word. Are you listening to this? John 4. And so we can continue to read and read and study and find this out. And so Jesus was prophesying. He was speaking of things that were to be fulfilled. So upon his resurrection, he says, these are the words which I said to you, verse 44, Luke 24, while I was yet with you. In other words, we need to interpret the four gospels in the light of his resurrection. Resurrection truths, truths about the gospel. These are the words which I said to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled. When were they fulfilled? They were fulfilled in his resurrection. That's important. Now, let's see something. I need your attention. You ready? Now, this is some of our books already. I guess it's in the charismatic ministry, but I just need you to hear it again. In John 14, John precisely, you know, in the, in the last session, I stopped short of discussing the name of Jesus with us. Praise the Lord. And we're going to do some study in it in, it in a moment. Now, John, in the synoptic, now this is not a comparison, but John had a peculiar way he wrote his synoptic account. Very peculiar. And the way he opened the Gospel of John in itself introduces it to us. Uh, uh, if you look at some of our books, the way all of our books, the way we do is that we give you the mode of interpretation from the beginning. So that by the time you read the introduction, I know people were careless, they'll skip the introduction and read the first chapter. You have all men lost. That introduction, just like if you, if you listen to me and you listen to me well, you notice that I do a lot of work on the introduction because that is how you can understand the whole thing. John's intro says in the beginning. Why does he write like that? Because that's how Jesus taught them in the 40 days. Beginning from Moses, Luke 24. And then 27, beginning at Moses. And Jesus also in John 5, when he says you search the scriptures, John 5, 39, for in them you think you have eternal life, they are they that testify of me. Listen to what I'm about to say. The direct reference of that scripture is the book of Genesis through to the book of uh, Deuteronomy. When he says you search the scriptures, the direct reference of that statement was the five books of Moses. That's why in verse 
45. Think not I'm come to accuse you before the Father. There's one who already accuses you. Jesus is not contrasting Moses. No. He's saying the same reason why Moses accused you is what you are doing now. You are rejecting the life of the scriptures. That was why Moses accused you category. He's not saying Moses was wrong. He's actually saying Moses was right. Moses accused you already. I'm not come to do that. Your accusation is already written and engraven. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote about me. So what was Moses accusing them of? He was accusing them of unbelief. Are you learning something? So John knew that the systematic study, I've said it to you before, without a systematic study of scripture, you will not know God. You don't just prance on the scriptures as you like. And say, oh, see Bible. You just wake up in the morning, open to one verse. Ah, what I delight to read today is the book of Ruth. Particularly Ruth 4. No, 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 nobody reads like that. You always tell me, there are so many contradictions in the Bible. I said, what are the contradictions? He said, he had gone to download some funny stuff. He said, for somewhere, says this, who do we believe now? Samuel says this one. Uh, Jesus says this one. Paul. And I asked him a question. I said, have you read the Bible before? Ah. He said, what kind of question is that? No, it's a simple question. I didn't say, have you glanced at the Bible? I didn't say, have you looked for verses? Have you read it? Now, Many of us are graduates of universities or polytechnics and, and college of education and some of us who are yet there. You know when they say, have you read your books? You know, you know what it means. <laughs> have you read your books? It's not you were in the class, you slept off in the middle or you attended first service, amen? <laughs> or you were part of the praise worship or slept off in the Bible study. When they say, have you read your books? They mean, have you read everything? So when they say, have you read the Bible? It means, have you read everything? You cannot read Genesis to Revelation and see contradictions. (laughs) It is self-explanatory. And so I ask the fellow, have you read it? Do I have to read the whole thing? Look at this guy. Oh. They say you failed the exam. You say why? They say, did you read everything? You say, do I have to read the whole textbook? No. Read the cover. <laughs> what are you talking about? Systematic study of scripture. And John shows us how. He says, in the beginning was the logos. Logos is not a spiritual word. It's a word developed by a man, Heroclitus, in the times, in the Greek times. That means the reason for reading, the reason for writing. Where you have the word logos, it means study. The essence of this. He says, in the beginning was the logos. In other words, just like John 5.45, what Jesus said, John is saying, The reason for Genesis is Jesus. Systematic study. And so John already presents something to us that from from the inception of the gospel of John, he shows you his destination. He shows you, he, he doesn't, John's destination was very clear. And that is why, pay attention of all the synoptics, he focused more, read the, he spoke, focused more, pardon me, on the last few weeks of Jesus' life here in Jerusalem, I mean. He took on the Passover, Jesus at the Passover, Jesus at the Feast of New Beginnings, Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. He says, he explains it all. 
Jesus in the temple. Jesus, he always put Jesus side by side with the ceremonies and the practices and say, this is the reality, that's a figure of speech. John deliberately writes his synoptic by picking out what is so vital in our study of the Old Testament. Very deliberate and very systematic. And so when he says in the beginning, that is the intro. The intro says the word was at the beginning. Then he said, no, what is in Genesis 1, 1 is heaven and earth. Exactly. That is the word. That's the logos. Union of heaven and earth. God coming down to man. Amen. Becoming flesh. That's Genesis 1, 1 for you. And that's how John saw the incarnation. And that's how Jesus taught it as well. So John is very specific. So listen carefully. And so John, of all the synoptics, picked out a critical phrase and word that Jesus used. I mentioned it the other time, but we're going to look at it again. In John 14, in John 14, John, in 17, 16 and 17, uses a phrase that no other person put in his own synoptic or is in any other book of the Bible. The phrase of the New Testament, allos paracletos, another comforter. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In John 14, 26, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. In John 15, 26, the comforter is come. Then in John 16, and then verse 7. John 16 and verse 7. The comforter will not come. When he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And in 1 John 2 and 1, if you sin, he says, we have a comforter with the Father. He is not confusing you. He is only re-emphasizing something he had written before. Now listen. John, in the way he wrote, you know, we're, we're looking at what Peter meant when he says times of refreshing will come. And we said, in the resurrection of Jesus comes the refreshing of man. Man restored to God's Original plan and, inst- and intention. This is the new birth. And so, John, of the synoptic writers, he uses or he explains the word spirit or Holy Ghost in a very unique fashion that you cannot but pay attention to it. The first time, he's going to mention the spirit. John. The Spirit is in John's Gospel, chapter 1. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, he refers to John the Baptist. Where John the Baptist, in John's Gospel 1, and verse 32. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. It abode upon him. Now, nobody sees Spirit. That is... I don't know what it's called, but you can't see spirit because the word spirit already means what cannot be seen. So when he says, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, it abode upon him, he confirms the deity of Jesus as God with man. Heaven on earth. Why do you say I saw the spirit? John is saying Genesis 1-2 has come to be fulfilled. That's what he's saying. Like as of a dove. Overing over the face. The same statement. He's saying John. Genesis 1-2. He's now fulfilled. God heaven on earth. He's now fulfilled. He's saying this is God. In man. That's why John will say. He's before me. I cannot untie his shoes. He was preferred before me. Because he's before me. The first time he mentions the spirit here, he mentions it in Jesus Christ. John 1.33. 
upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descend and remain on him the same is he which baptizes with the holy ghost and i saw and bore record that this is the son of god now notice something that john says the same is he which baptizes with the holy ghost matthew says it matthew 3 11 mark 1 8 and Luke three sixteen and 17. They all reference the same thing. Baptized with the Holy Ghost. I need you to pay attention. In John's utterance here, John 1, 33, Matthew 3, 11 and 12, Mark 1, 8, Luke 3, 16, 17. He's referring to the resurrection. When it says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. That did not happen till Jesus rose from the dead. So, John, John the Baptist now, according to John who wrote the synoptic, references the Spirit of God or the Spirit as a resurrection reality baptizes with the holy ghost then in john 3 the second time he's going to talk about the spirit john's gospel chapter 3 except a man is born again verse 3 he cannot see the kingdom verse 5 except a man is born of water which refers to the spirit he cannot enter the two statements obviously refer to where again the resurrection that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say you must be born again. The wind breath, where they said you hear the sound, you can't tell where it's coming from, where it's going to. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. No one was born on the spirit till he rose. So another reference here, another reference here, the use and the mention of the word spirit refers to the resurrection. Listen carefully. Now, the fourth time, which isn't directly mentioned that way, but we can infer it. Because obviously from John 3, the use of water refers to the spirit. And not just the spirit, the spirit in the resurrection. Water there is symbolic of the work, not the person. So, just like Isaac is symbolic of a miracle of Jesus' resurrection, he is not the figure of Christ, his birth is. So, in John 4, verse 10, he will, if you ask of him, he will give you living water. Now, if you had read John 3, you will know the living water refers to the spirit. Because in John 3, Jesus later replaced the word spirit with eternal life. He dropped the word spirit when he got to his resurrection, John 3, 14, 15, 16. Then he called it eternal life. Then as he said, the spirit... Then it says eternal life. Then it says, I am not come. The Son of Man hasn't come to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the Spirit, the life, the Son of God replace terminologies. John 4, living water or the water that is life. John 4, 14, a well springing up unto everlasting life. John 4, the conversation continues on the subject of worship. He says, neither would you go to Jerusalem again and worship, nor come to this place. For the hour cometh and now is. And every time Jesus says the hour cometh and now is, that is his death, burial, and resurrection. When those that will worship the Father will do it in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. And those that worship him will worship him in spirit and truth. He's referring again to the resurrection. Because he called them, he called God their father in the resurrection. So again, the spirit, John 4, 23 to 24, refers to the resurrection. What else? John 6. Remember that sermon? He had spent time talking about the bread and the bread and his blood. And everybody said, what's he talking about? John 6. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life in you. And everybody's freaking out. What are you talking about? John 6, 63. The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth or raises from the dead. The words I speak to you, they are what? Spirit 
and life. In other words, the life and the spirit are one and the same. My sermon, my words are spirit and life. And we know again that he's referring to his resurrection. John 1, John 3, John 4, John 6, then John 7. In John 7, I, I quoted it earlier, that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, He that is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. These spake he of the Spirit with those that believe on him. John is now clearer for you. Should receive, but the Holy Ghost was what? Now, observe the word given is italicized because it's not in the Greek. The Holy Ghost was not yet. For Jesus was not glorified. In other words, we will see the Spirit in Jesus being glorified. Just like John the Baptist prophesied, just like Jesus taught in John 3 and John 4 and then John 6, now in John 7, John is letting you see the Spirit is not yet because Jesus is not yet glorified. Because he teaches the spirit in a different way. Jesus is not yet glorified. He hasn't been raised from the dead. He hasn't died yet. So the spirit is not yet. And then the use of the term spirit dies down for now until John 14. In case you didn't understand that systematic explanation now you're going to get it in john 14 listen carefully now he says in my father's house there are many mansions if you're not so i told you i go to prepare a place for you and i'll come again receive you unto myself verse two and three so that where i am there you may be also then the conversation began where are you going to whether you go I, whether I, where I go, go to you know so what do you know i am the way i am the truth i am the life no man coming to the father but by me come on talk to us plainly have you been long with me you've not known the father he that has seen me has seen the father every work i've been doing he says the father is the one doing them and he that believes in me verse 12 as the scripture has said no, he that believes in me, the works that I do, pardon me, shall he do also. And greater. Now, he's not doing a comparison. Like, you know, Jesus healed four, I'll heal 40. Now, that's reading badly. He that believes in me, the question is, believe what? Believe that I'll come again and receive you to myself. If you believe that, it says the works that I do, you will do. Now, don't pick that out of context. And greater, that is, you'll do it, not do greater. It's greater because I go to my father. Now, what's he talking about? In verse 2 and 3, he has said there will be many mansions. So the greater will be, I will do it in many people. So Jesus is saying, in my resurrection, I'll come back and I'll stay in a mone. What's a mone? A mone is a place you stay, not to rest and then take a short drink. No, where you continue your activities. In other words, the four gospels will not be historical. They will be patterns, examples. That's why he used the term mone, mansions. So he says here, he says, whatever you ask the Father, that will I do. So he's not making a comparison. That will I do. How is he going to do it? Because you have become his place of dwelling where he continues his activities. That will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said, ask in my name and I will do it. Now ask the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Who will abide with you forever? The Father. 
Who is the comforter? Don't get it lost. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because they see him not, but you see him for he dwells with you. And then shall be in you. In other words, John is about to give you a clarity of the use of the word pneuma or the spirit of God or Agios pneuma, the Holy Ghost that was not yet. Then he says, I will not leave you comfortless, guys. I will come to you in a little while. The world will see me, but you see me because I leave you leave also. In that day, you will know why I'm in the Father. Then put aside John 14, 16 and 17. Put it in verse 20. And I am in you. And you are in me. In other words, the use of the spirit by John and the Allos Paracletos is a union. God and man in Christ in the resurrection, in the new creation. That's why he said the Holy Ghost was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. But when he's glorified out of his belly, that conception, that resurrection shall flow rivers of living water. That is, we're going to see the Spirit in thousands, millions, hundreds of millions. That will be his money where he stays and continues to work. In other words, here now, Jesus' work in the resurrection and in redemption is in the spirit. The spirit is the result of his ascension. So when he says, Allos Paracletos, the comforter, he is referring to he himself now, not coming in the womb of Mary, but in the womb of the resurrection. And when that happens, you and I and Jesus will be found in the Spirit. Our relationship will not be kindred from the genealogy of Abraham or from the genealogy of David. It will be from the resurrection. The Spirit was not yet because Jesus was not glorified. So John writes the term the spirit to refer to the resurrection of Jesus, his ascension, and you and I being beneficiaries of it. That's why in John 20, upon his resurrection, what does he say? We've read John 14, 15, and 16. In John 20, he came to them and said, Peace be unto you, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. Send me away. Has the Father sent me where? Where? Oh, you know, has he sent me into the womb of Mary? No. Has he sent me to the cross? No. Has the Father sent me? Go read John 14, 15, 16. He sent into our hearts. Because the Father sent me into your heart, that is why I will send you. As the Father have sent me, this is the reason why I'm sending you. Then the Bible says, he breathed on and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. John 20, 22. Take off the resurrection. I told you, re replace the word spirit, Holy Ghost, in the four Gospels. I'm talking about the book of John with the resurrection of Jesus. And you are saying the same thing. Except the man is born of the resurrection, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Would that be correct? Yes, are you sure? Yes, are you sure? Yes, he that baptizes with his resurrection, would that be correct? Yes, would that be correct? Yes, okay, what about that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the resurrection is raised from the dead. Would that be correct? Yes, are you sure? All right, what about shall have in himself the resurrection life and shall not thirst again? Would that be correct? Yes, the hours come, those who worship the Father would do it in the resurrection of Jesus. Would that be correct? Yes, 
Are you sure? Because that is the truth about God. Okay, what about John 6? Oh, the flesh profits not. It is the resurrection that quickeneth. The words I speak to you, they are about my resurrection and my life. Oh, good. What about John 7? Out of his resurrection shall flow. Are you getting this now? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you this union, that he will abide with you forever, even my resurrection, which is the truth. Hallelujah. With the wall cannot receive, because he sees him not. He's with you, and shall be in you in the resurrection. Hallelujah. If I do not go, he will not come. That's not a replacement. If I don't die and raise from the dead, this allos paracletos can happen. He's not saying, I'm disturbing the spirit. There is a third person out of us. The father has done his own New Testament. The son is in the four gospels. The spirit. <laughs> no. Someone say, do you believe in Trinity? Yes, I believe the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. Maybe not the way you think. Praise the Lord. So he's saying here that I will come. Jesus never said I will go, somebody else will come. He never said so. I will come, but I will come in the Allos Paracletos. We're going to find the Father and the Son, the Son and the Believer in a union, another Paracletos. John now tells us, if you sin, you have a Paracletos. It's with the Father, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The propitiation, not only for our sins, 1 John 2, 1 and 2, but for the whole world. And 1 John 3, 24 says he gave us his spirit. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in heaven. No, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. So you can safely say Jesus in his resurrection is the Allos Paracletos. Will that be correct? Jesus in the resurrection. I'm not saying Jesus was raised and touched in his nose and legs. No. Jesus in his resurrection where he comes to tabernacle in the believer. That is the Allos Paracletos. What about the word another? The word allo simply means same. 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 So in the resurrection, John teaches the spirit. The spirit is what happened in the resurrection where we have a union with God. Heaven and earth together. And so, the reality of salvation is the spirit. John, sorry, Paul, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus set us free from the law of sin and death. Where is the spirit of life? In Christ. For what the law could not do, that was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son like a sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He says, those that are of the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. Those that are of the spirit, pay attention, do mind the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, to be spiritual in mind is life and peace. So the carnal mind is enemies of God. Not so the Lord God, neither can it be. So those that are in the flesh cannot please God. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, if any has not the spirit of Christ. Can you see it? He's none of his. Then he says to you, if Christ be where? Can you see it? Then the, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The body of sin is dead. The body is dead because of sin. Not your physical body. It's Romans 6.6. 6. The body of sin that has been crucified. That has been destroyed. 
If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your own mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Says, O brethren, we are dead as not to the flesh, not to the flesh. For if you live of the flesh, you will die. But he, through the spirit, you mortify the deeds of the old man, the body. Romans 6, 6. This is salvation. You are alive. 4, verse 14. As many as are taken by the spirit of God. Taken from the flesh, taken from darkness, taken from sin, from the devil. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption. Hereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we are children, we're heirs. Joint heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs together with Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? So in the resurrection, we have no nose to touch. We have no fingers to touch. We have the spirit to know. Hallelujah. We're not touching his side. No. Hallelujah. Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Know ye not that you are the temple of God, for the Spirit of God dwells in you. The resurrection of Jesus is the indwelling of the Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. That means we are born in his resurrection. So, when we say the Word and the Spirit, don't get it confused. There are not two elements. The word is the message. The spirit is the result of it. The word, the promise that God made in the Old Testament can be summarized in that he gave to us his spirit. So the word and the spirit are one and the same. They're one and the same. The message of the gospel, the content of it, the resurrection of Jesus. Is Jesus alive in the spirit? Glory to God. In us today. Hallelujah. So when I receive the gospel, I receive the spirit. Hallelujah. The content of the gospel is the spirit. The content of the word is the spirit. Don't say, he has the word, he has the spirit. That's confusion. Why then do we say the word and the spirit? Yes, the spirit therefore. Now, some, some scholars have helped us to say something. I, I loved it. Uh, Brother Hagin used to say that. There is the legal side and the vital side. I don't use that phrase, but I like it. The legal side and then the vital side. Which means that this is what God has done for us in Christ. The spirit of God now brings it into our everyday experience. What it means is. The spirit is the word walking. Hallelujah. The spirit is the word fulfilled. Is the word fulfilled. So when I look into the scriptures and I see, oh, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 and I see Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, I am complete in him. Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you the hope of glory. Oh, I see Ephesians 2, 10, you are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Oh, as I begin to pray the prayer that Paul says, he says, see, I don't cease to make mention of you in prayers and to pray and ask the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom, better still, the wisdom of the spirit. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. He says, they will grant unto you. He will grant it to you. I'm praying. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Or the wisdom of the spirit. Knowledge. He's speaking of there. Knowledge of the spirit. Which grants you wisdom. Knowledge of the indwelling of the spirit. And he says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what is the riches. Or the inheritance of the riches of the glory in his saints. And what is the exceeding greatness. 
of his power towards what who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him as own right hand in the heavenly places far above all praise by power might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but that which has come he's put all things under his feet he gave the bread over all things to the church his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all chapter 2 verse 1 and you and you who were dead in trembling and sins, whom he had quickened, who walked according to the, of the, uh, uh, the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh, what the time, sorry, walketh among you all, had a covenant time pass in the flesh. He says, and we were nature children of wrath, even as unto others, but God who is rich in mercy. Where do I see all of this? It's the fact of the spirit. He takes the experience of Jesus and says, this is your experience. Why is it so? Because Jesus lives in you as the Spirit. So his experience is yours, not because he has lent you or you borrowed it. It's because he actually lives in you. If someone lives somewhere and you ask him, what happened to you? He says, I died. What happened to you? I was buried. What happened to you? I rose again. And I'm in triumph right now. And then you say, oh yes, is that what happened to you? What happened to the body? We'll look at you. Are you well? The person dwelling in here right now is a spirit. The one dwelling in here right now is Christ Jesus himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So his experience becomes yours because he now lives in you. And then, he wants to have more experiences with you. More. More with you. That he may abide with you forever. As that money, where he stays and continues to act. If Jesus rose from the dead, and after 40 days he runs out of the world, how can we say he's alive? The only person that has still been living in this earth for over 2,000 years is Jesus Christ. He's the only person who is alive now. Hallelujah. He's alive, glorified. He's alive, glorified in the saints, in the saints in Ethiopia, in the saints in Sudan, in the saints in America, in the saints in India, in the saints in China. It's all over the world. Hallelujah. Glorified. The right hand of the Father advances in the nations. The right hand of the Father is in different continents. God rotting his power and we seated in it. Jesus Christ. This is what happened when he rose from the dead. So what the resurrection means to us is the indwelling of the spirit. Jesus has come back and he has been back for thousands of years and he lives in everyone that has believed. He has not asked you to perform. He has said, whatever you ask, that will I do. That's what he said. Whatever you ask, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. So the reality of Christianity is the Spirit walking in us. Jesus vitally living literally in you. Let me say it. Jesus Christ literally, vitally, living in you. Someone say, how do you know? A guy asked me this question years ago. When you say, Jesus is in us, he's in us. What, do, what I mean, I mean is it not, are we not just feeling good? I asked him a question. Have you seen yourself before? He said, what do you mean? Your real self. He said, I don't know what you mean by that. Man is not this body. He said, yes, yes. So he believes. He says, man is a spirit. Yes, that lives in this body. Have you seen it before? 
He said, no. So why do you ask me whether we have seen Jesus before? The same way Jesus lives in you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a spiritual fact. And that is what we mean by we are born again. Yeah. Hallelujah. The Savior lives in us. This is the fact of the epistles. This is what Paul wrote several letters over. He's with us. He is in us literally. It's not a feeling. It's not a mood. It's not something that happens every now and then. When I sing a good song, then I feel. No, it's not a feel-good experience. It's the reality of Christianity. Hallelujah. The Allos Paracletus. God. The Father in the Son, tabernacling with us. Not just in the incarnation, but in the re resurrection, he lives vitally in us. So, what do we do? We give him expression in all that we do. Our change of conduct is a function of his resurrection. Our change of mind our change of purpose and plan in life is because Jesus Christ raised from the dead is glorified in us and the Father is glorified in him. This is Christianity. Christ literally living in us. Literally living in us by his spirit. You learning something? You learning something? Yes, and John gives that to us vitally. So, let's add something more quickly because of our time. Jesus in John 14 now says, whatever you ask in my name. Now, the way we say name, we say, J-E-S-U-S. -S. You know, I have have someone who said that, <laughs> uh, you know, the name of you is very powerful. That even David, when he wanted to conquer Goliath, he picked five stones. J E S U S. And he used one. <laughs> so only the J is powerful. Without the E. All right, why don't you not start bearing J? No, the point was the name Jesus in Hebrew is not five letters. I disappoint you. It's just like grace in Greek is not five letters. Grace is charis, spell it, C-H-A-R-I-S, it's six. So five is the number of grace. Grace is not spelled in five letters. That's English language. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, some of these things are fables. So you say, Jesus, you know, the truth is, Jesus' name was not unique to him. That is J. When he said his name is Jesus, they say, "Eh, where did you get that from?" People were bearing Jesus before him. They bought Jesus after him. There's even a player from Man City. <laughs> so I say, "How can somebody be bearing Jesus?" That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you are very ignorant. <laughs> The name of Jesus is not spelled in letters. Somebody was arguing the other day on, <laughs> on visual media uh, whether, uh, did you hear what I called it? Facial media. I know you didn't hear it. <laughs> you are too spiritual to hear what I said. In spite of the uh, number of you, you didn't hear it. On social media, he said, Jesus is not his name. His name is Yeshua Mashai. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can glorify ignorance. Yeshua Mashai. Someone says, mm, deep. Deep. He said, because there was no J. So people are now arguing over letters, vowels, consonants, alphabets. If you want to go to, into astrology, let's know. 
when you say the name, every student of the Bible knows names refer to exploits, position, exploits, position, what people have done or they are doing. So when he says, whatever you ask in my name, he didn't say, call the name of Jesus five times. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hmm. You will call that name. The first ten people that called Jesus ten times, today is their miracle day. <laughs> Preachers use that to just get your attention because they know you are sleeping. If you like, use microphone. It makes nothing, no difference. You know, when he says the name, in my name, whatever you ask, in John 20, 31, you will have life through his name. Mark 16, 17, in my name. Luke 24, 47, repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name. Acts 2, 21, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. Now say, Jesus, raise your voice. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. That word call means to cry, to scream. If your situation is really serious, you can't be saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The problem has not hit you well. You will raise your voice and say, Jesus. Confusion increasing his volume. <laughs> Say, Jesus. Jesus. Some even cut cake with it. <laughs> J-E-S-U-L. It's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Peter said, listen, <laughs> his name through faith in his name has made this man to walk what do you mean by that he says that Jesus that you killed God has raised up that is the name so the accomplishment is what is referred to as the name what did he accomplish? He's raised from the dead. He's raised from the dead. He has defeated hatred. He has defeated sin. He has defeated the devil. And now the father's dream is fulfilled. He now dwells in us. We are now his dwelling place. That is the name of Jesus. So when I say in the name of Jesus. I am saying, Jesus Christ raised from the dead now dwells in me. He is the one that is doing this now. So the name of Jesus refers to us, a new creature in Christ, as the indwelling of the Spirit. That is the name of Jesus. Not spelling letters. No. That's why I said, in my name, you will speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. In my name, you will cast out demons. Hallelujah. Now the question is, who is casting out demons? That will I do. Hallelujah. That's his name. That means he's walking now. He's walking now. He's walking now. If you drink any deadly shall not hurt you. He says you will take up serpents. You will lay hands on the sick. Everything Jesus was doing in the four gospels, he's still doing now in his name. The name of Jesus means the work he has accomplished. The name of Jesus means what he has done. The name of Jesus means what he's doing now. So when we suffer for his name, we're suffering because he's working in us. If they hated him, they will hate us. If they didn't like him, they will not like us. That's what it means to suffer for his name. We are bearing his life. We are not just taking the message, we are bearing his life. The message we preach is the message of the life that dwells in us. We walk in his name. We sing in his name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's why when you speak with tongues, 
Don't say, how am I sure? How am I sure it's of God? You are born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. You are born of the Spirit of God. So it's in his name. Hallelujah. He has his hands in all of this. Glory to God. He has his hands in all of this. He has given me his strength. He has given me his power. Hallelujah. He has his hands all over me. Glory to God. You know why we overcome temptation? Jesus Christ is walking in us. He gave us the example. Hallelujah. You know why we are passionate about the lost? Because Jesus Christ is in us. You know why we are passionate about the study of scripture? Because Jesus Christ is in us. Do you know why we love the word? Because Jesus Christ is in us. Do you know why we praise the Father all the time? Because Jesus Christ is in us. It's in his name. Do you know why you pray a lot? Because Jesus Christ is in you. He's doing this. He's the one doing this. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In his name. In what he has done. It's not in the mention. In the, at the mention of your name. No. At the name. Hallelujah. At what he has done. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Of things in heaven. Of things on earth. And under the earth. Hallelujah. And what did he call the name? God has highly exalted him. The resurrection is the name of Jesus. So when I say in the name of Jesus. I say because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And because he dwells and is alive in me today, I command you in the name of Jesus because of the resurrection. Hallelujah. And when you go to any place to preach, I come in the name of the Lord. I am saying Jesus Christ is the one that has come. Hallelujah. Because he's walking in me. Glory to God. No wonder Paul said, we preach not ourselves. But Jesus Christ the Lord, we are servants for Christ's sake. Hallelujah. In other words, we are living expressions of Jesus. You know, your conduct is his conduct. Hallelujah. His habits are your habits. As you got born again, you receive the habits of Jesus. You love to pray. You love to study the word. You don't curse people. You know why you don't curse people? Because Jesus Christ is the one living in you. You don't hate people because Jesus Christ is the one living in you. Hallelujah. You don't hate others. When they curse you, you bless them. Just like Jesus. You are not copying Jesus. No, you are giving him expression. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that's what you are. That's what you are. That's what you are. We said he never said bye. He came back. He came back. And he has come back to live in us. You love to pray? You love to study? You love to live right? You don't do evil? Because he doesn't do evil. The one who dwells in you doesn't do evil. You don't hate? Because he doesn't hate. Amen. You don't, you don't. You, you, don't, you don't return evil for evil because Jesus doesn't do it. You're not trying to be like Jesus, even though, yes, that's like Jesus, but the truth is, he's literally living in you. Yes, Hallelujah. So the four Gospels have become a pattern. This is what he's still doing in the earth today. If they hate him, he loves back. If he sees sickness, he heals the sick. Jesus does not go for showbiz. No, he heals the sick because he wants them well. That's why I often told them, tell nobody. Only two people did Jesus say, go and tell people. Two people. The fellow, those guys who were uh, uh, lepers. Why? Because lepers were ostracized. They were not allowed amongst people. So he says, go and meet the priest. Let the priest satisfy that your feet and then go amongst the people. The second fellow was a guy who was mad in the caves. He was already ostracized. Go and tell your brother. Show them that you are now well. He never told any other people, go and give testimonies. That's not why he was doing it. He was doing it because he wanted them well. You are not a showbiz. You love people to be well because Jesus Christ is living in you. 
Hallelujah. You are a living expression of Jesus. His utterances are on your lips. His love is in your heart. You know, at the age of 12, Jesus was found four days studying the scriptures. You know you love to study the scriptures? His love is your love. His passion is your passion. They wanted to make him king. He said, no. You know why? You, you detest what is not God's purpose in your life? Because Jesus Christ is living in you. Jesus always walked in God's plan. You always walk in God's plan. Jesus refused to yield to the world. You, you refuse to yield to the world. Jesus never bowed to hate. You never bow to hatred. Hallelujah. How is this possible? The Allos Paracletos. The Allos Paracletos. The same comforter is living in you now. Hallelujah. Lift your hands wherever you are seated and just pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost.